Tesla CEO Elon Musk unveils a range of roof tiles with built-in photovoltaic cells that work like traditional solar panels but look like standard tiles. The NRC will meet with officials from Pacific Gas and Electric to discuss the licensee's failure to maintain the emergency core cooling system at the Diablo Canyon Nuclear Plant in San Luis Obispo, California. And the chief editor of Renewable Energy World joins me to discuss the exciting Block Island Wind Project. It's Wednesday, November 2nd, and this is Power Today. Hello and welcome to Power Today for Wednesday, November 2nd. I'm Cassie Haley. We begin this edition of Power Today at Universal Studios Los Angeles, where Tesla CEO Elon Musk recently unveiled a range of roof tiles with built-in photovoltaic cells that work like traditional solar panels but are designed to look like standard roof tiles. With this innovation, Musk and Tesla are taking an already important piece of the renewable energy puzzle and making it more usable and attractive to the average homeowner and consumer. Musk said at the event, We need to make solar panels as appealing as electric cars have become. It needs to be beautiful, affordable, and seamlessly integrated. If all of those things are true, why would you go any other direction? It's never going to wear out. It's made of quartz. It has a quasi-infinite lifetime. Rather than having large panels mounted to a structure on a property, Tesla's new roof tiles are designed to be a more appealing and attractive way of adding solar panels and renewable energy to a home. In fact, looking at them, you can hardly differentiate between them and a standard roof tile. The introduction of the new tiles with embedded photovoltaic technology comes as Tesla is in the process of taking over energy firm SolarCity, of which Musk is one of the biggest shareholders. No immediate pricing was provided for the new tiles, but but Musk did suggest that the installed cost is less than a normal roof and the cost of electricity. In other power news, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission will meet with officials from the Pacific Gas and Electric Company on November 15th to discuss a preliminary finding regarding the licensee's failure to adequately maintain the emergency core cooling system at the Diablo Canyon nuclear power plant in San Luis Obispo, California. Each reactor at Diablo Canyon is equipped with two emergency core cooling systems that are used to provide cooling water to a reactor under some accident conditions. During a scheduled test conducted in May, workers discovered that a maintenance problem had rendered one of the Unit 2 emergency core cooling systems inoperable for an extended period of time, beginning as early as October 2014. A second emergency core cooling system was available had it been needed. The licensee has corrected the condition and changes have been made to maintenance procedures to prevent recurrence. No decision on the final safety significance of the finding or any additional NRC actions are expected to be made at the conference. That decision will be announced at a later time and documented in an NRC inspection report. We're going to take a short break. When Power Today returns, the chief editor of Renewable Energy World joins me from her East Coast office to discuss the exciting Block Island Wind Project. Inside the Industry is up next. Stay with us. From December 13th through 15th, thousands will be in Orlando for the largest power industry show in the world, PowerGen International 2016. Hello, I'm Cassie Haley, host of the daily power news and information show, Power Today, and I'm here to tell you about a great way to get your message to the PowerGen audience. At this year's show, I'll be conducting content interviews with a select group of companies and thought leaders who recognize the importance of video in marketing their message. These one-on-one -on -one interviews will be featured on Power Today and will then be made available to use in any way you'd like. Power Today airs daily across a broad variety of Penwell sites, including Power Engineering, and has become a known and respected brand within the world of power. We take pride in keeping the power industry informed and telling our viewers about the exciting stories, people, and companies that are moving the industry forward. This is your opportunity to reach the ideal audience and to make sure your message is heard. I've been speaking with Bill Newsom today about Mitsubishi's J-Series gas turbine, the M501J. There is limited time available to schedule your PowerGen interview, so please don't put off locking in what could be your best marketing investment of the year. I'm Cassie Haley. I look forward to speaking with you at PowerGen International.
Welcome back. Jennifer Runyon is the chief editor of Renewable Energy World. She recently joined us via Skype from her East Coast office to talk about the Block Island Wind Project. Here's today's Inside the Industry. Thanks for joining us, Jennifer. I'm excited to talk about renewables today, especially wind. It's really taking off. Can you tell me about a project that's taking center stage? Absolutely, Cassie. So we are up to 75 gigawatts of cumulative installed capacity of wind in the U.S., which is a huge number. And the biggest project that is that has come into light this summer is the Block Island Wind Farm. It is the U.S.'s very first offshore wind farm. As compared to Europe, where they've got, oh my gosh, at least 40 offshore wind farms at this point. Here in the U.S., we've got our first. It's out there, and it's up and running. Talk to us a little bit about what's involved in, in the entire process on a project of this scope. Yeah, so this was a 30 megawatt wind farm. So that's really not a big wind farm in terms of overall generating capacity. But because it was the first one in the U.S., it was, it, it was really important. And there were a lot of logistical hurdles to get over. We don't have the, the manufacturing. We don't have the vessel support here in the U.S. yet because we're just getting started. So, mm -hmm. for example, they had to bring the generators uh, over from France. Those were, those were made by Alstom, which is now GE. They had to bring the blades from Denmark. Um, and then they also had to bring the towers from Spain. I mean, those are not small parts. I mean, it must be a lot involved with transport. There is. They, they actually needed to um, bring a boat over from the EU to, you know, to bring it all, all here. But to install the, the towers and the blades, there was not a ship large enough in U.S. waters that, were, that would be able to do that, that would be able to support the crane that needed to lift the, the turbines into place. And so what they had to do is bring a ship from Europe, station it out in the Rhode Island waters. That ship was not allowed to ever touch U.S. shores because in the U.S. we have something called the Jones Act, which means that any goods and services transported in U.S. waters have to be transported by U.S. flagged vessels with U.S. crews on U.S. owned boats. So, so it made for a really interesting and sort of difficult process. They actually had to bring a boat up from Louisiana, actually two boats, from a company called Monco. Um, and they, that was the, the vessel that would go back and forth between the actual boat that was doing the installation and the shore where they were picking up the parts. It was, it was quite an involved process. How big are these things once they're actually assembled out there in the ocean? Oh, that's such a good question. I went out there uh, myself. I was invited by GE to go out on a boat in the water. And man, these things are huge. They are taller than the Statue of Liberty. You know, and there's five of them in the water. They're just these, these behemoth structures that, in my mind, are these beautiful sculptures. Um, so really, really big, very heavy, big projects. Now, this may be the first offshore wind farm going online in America, but what can we expect in the next few years? Do you think we'll have a lot more? Yeah, we certainly will. I mean, Renewable Energy World is tracking at least 20 other projects. They're all up and down the East Coast, with the exception of the coastal waters of Connecticut and New Hampshire. Um, every other state all the way down to South Carolina has a proposed offshore wind farm, and, and so does Lake Erie. There's the Icebreaker project that is being proposed in off, uh, Cleveland, Ohio, actually. So lots, lots to look forward to in the offshore wind industry. Just curious, why not Connecticut and New Hampshire? You know, I don't know. It's probably because they are being able to meet their mandates, their renewable energy mandates, without it. Mm -hmm. um, it, it also doesn't mean that those waters are not being looked at. They, you know, they just haven't announced a project yet. Okay. Well, it's been fascinating, Jennifer. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you next week. That's going to wrap things up for us on Power Today. You can link to the show directly at powertoday.tv, and you can follow me at the Cassie Haley on Twitter. For everyone at Power Today, have a great day. We'll see you back here tomorrow at noon, 11 Central.